Good morning, everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot for being here, and it's a huge honor to talk to you guys about our research, even though you guys are giving away an Apple Watch, but we'll still <laughs> <laughs> wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing, and I, I think before, before I do that, I kind of owe you an explanation about why, you know, why is Google interested in contact lenses in, in the first place? Where did this come from? Why do we think it's worthwhile? And where is this project going? So this Venn diagram gives a, a very high-level overview of how we select our projects inside of Google X and Google Life Sciences, which is a part of, of Google X focusing on, on medical-type devices. And there are three key ingredients when we go about selecting a project. One is, well, th this project has to, if we're able to solve it, um, address some sort of huge problem that could impact the lives of millions of people. That, that's one key ingredient. The second is we have to have at our disposal an idea, some sort of radical solution that has never been demonstrated yet, but if it were, would conclusively solve that huge problem. The, the third part, which is possibly the most important, is we need to have exclusive access to some breakthrough technology that would make this radical solution possible in the first place. And if we do have access to those three key ingredients, and it's even if it's an extremely risky project, if it can solve a huge problem, it's probably worth doing. And so I wanted to give you one example of a project that, that we feel does meet all of those criteria, and that is, interestingly enough, diabetes. So now I, I, I owe you an explanation for why we're working on contact lenses and why we're interested in, in diabetes. But hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll you'll understand why, and you'll see why we're so extremely excited about this. Now, the, the problem is ridiculously um, acute for uh, the field of, of diabetes. I don't know how many people in this room are directly affected or know people who are affected by diabetes of one form or another today. It's a, it's a huge percentage of, of the population. Um, around the world, hundreds of millions of people are currently affected by diabetes of one form or another. And the, the scary thing about this is this problem is, is growing extremely quickly. It is um, understood that roughly 35% of the population in the U.S. are suspected of being pre-diabetic. Probably not diagnosed, but probably severely at risk of becoming, uh, becoming diabetic. And that's, that's amazing. The concern is that well, one of the important ways of trying to manage this disease, if you have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and one of the ways of trying to pre either delay or altogether prevent the onset of diabetes is having access to one very important piece of information, and that is your blood glucose information. Blood glucose changes extremely quickly throughout the day is shown on the, the next slide. Here's an example of a, of a healthy person, and you can see that their, their blood glucose levels could you know, double throughout the day after meals, et cetera. And a, a person's body produces insulin that meets the glucose that allows you to, to process it, um, but there are very wide fluctuations throughout the day. A person with diabetes is not effective at utilizing this glucose, and they may need to dose insulin um, to try to keep their blood glucose under control. The better you're able to stabilize your blood glucose levels through behavior, through, through diet, through activity, et cetera, the, the more healthy you're going to be and the less chance you have of developing diabetes in the first place. But if you look at just the sort of, I guess, the frequency response of this data, it is significant. It changes quickly. But if we look at the way that people currently manage the disease, it is through essentially pricking your finger, taking a drop of blood, and using a, a portable uh, instrument to measure the blood glucose. And this is typically done on the order of four times a day. And if you look at this plot, you can imagine that you know, that's, probably not, that's probably not enough. This parameter changes so quickly. And you're using that information to, to close the loop on, for example, drug delivery or, or insulin delivery. Well, the diabetes technology community has risen to the challenge and has created continuous glucose monitors that will ideally give you continual access to blood glucose information. Um, but these devices are essentially the instrument that you'd use to test a, a finger prick drop of blood that's attached to your body with a small needle that's placed under the skin. And you can imagine that's extremely valuable if, if your life depends on accurately tracking this data 
but it is not a pleasant device to wear. It's not pleasant to prick your finger. It's not pleasant to have a large device with a needle protruding from it taped onto your, your abdomen. Now, here's why this is so, such, a, such an important problem. If you look at the, the best way to think about this is kind of a histogram. The number of people in the different categories of, of diabetes. It's, it's, for the layperson, you think that, oh, diabetes is, is diabetes, but that is absolutely not true. There's a huge spectrum. Starting from type one diabetes, these people um, are born with the disease, they, their body produces little or no insulin at all, and they absolutely need to have access to accurate blood glucose information. Um, that said, there's a relatively small number of people, a couple million people in the US. The second category is type two intensive, people with very extreme cases of type two diabetes that also need to, to dose insulin. This is, a, again, a relatively small percentage, um, but the existing diabetes technology that is out there are typically targeted at these top two categories. And the reason for that, it's not that the rest of the people are being ignored, it's that the technology simply does not exist to give you a palatable way of measuring your blood glucose. In other words, if, you're, if your life depends on having these four data points, you're going to prick your finger, you're going to wear this device, you, you don't care, you'll do whatever you need to do. But if instead you're thinking, hmm, it, I, this information may help me um, re reduce my chances of becoming pre-diabetic in 10 years, you're, you're, not going to, you're not going to do it. The burden is, is way too high. So we need to introduce much more convenient ways of, of gaining access to this data. And you know, the, the numbers of people who are either bona fide pre-diabetic or at risk through genetic predisposition, through pregnancy, through lifestyle is, is huge. Again, hundreds of millions of people. And if, if these populations do have access to this information and they're given actionable feedback based on it, well, this can prevent people from becoming uh, type two diabetic in the first place, which could have a huge impact on their life and also on the, the cost of healthcare. As the population of people with diabetes grows, the, the cost of, of treating those people grows as well. Just a few numbers for, for reference. The average cost per year of treating someone who with pre-diabetes is about $500. Uh, the average cost per year of someone with, with actual type 2 or type 1 diabetes is on the order of $10,000 a year. And so the, the preventative cost of trying to, to be more proactive in this disease in, instead of reactive instead of waiting until a person actually has full-fledged diabetes and applying these technologies to them, be proactive instead, develop technologies that are actually palatable for someone to wear who, who does not have the disease yet, could make a huge difference on people's lives and the cost of, of treating them. So let, let's revisit the Venn diagram with, with that information, and then you can kind of see our thought process, um, which is you know, kind of how we decided to, to work on this in the, in the first place. Do we have a huge problem? Definitely, and it's a very, very succinct, self-contained problem statement. We want to bring glucose monitoring to over 100 million people, people that are out there that are at risk or have pre-diabetes. There's a, a clear need. No one has solved this problem yet, but we, we really want to do this because it could improve people's lives. The radical solution that we've proposed, that we've been working on for a couple of years now, is a smart contact lens. And the, this lens would ideally solve the problem because it's a, it's a wearable device that many millions of people wear anyway. Um, even if you don't wear contact lenses, if, if there's a, you, know, you have an option of wearing a device that many people wear that's comfortable, that also corrects your vision, and it can give you this valuable information, you're likely to want to do that over, say, pricking your finger. So the, the choice is, um, is ideally pretty clear. Uh, but it's tough. We need to be able to take the instrument that's used for measuring glucose from a, a, a finger stick or a continuous glucose monitor and somehow shrink it to the size that can fit inside of a standard soft contact lens. If we can do that, then we could have a device that is monitoring glucose levels, not in blood, of course, but in tear film. It's been shown that there is a correlation between the glucose levels in, in your tears and that in, in blood. Um, finally, the breakthrough technology that we have been working on really hard over the past couple of years, and I'll talk a little bit about this today, are, are a few things. One is just miniaturization. We need to make things 
really small. The chips, the passive components, power supplies, antennas, everything needs to, sh to shrink. And it, it's not just making it smaller, it has to be flexible. It has to be essentially two-dimensional, mass producible, and extremely cheap. Second, this, we have to make a true platform. This is not intended to be a single, you know, one time you check into the hospital and it's a diagnostic. This, we want this to be a true wearable device that's comfortable, that seamlessly integrates into, into your lifestyle because this is not intended to be for the, the, the most severe patients. This is intended to be for, for all of us um, as, a, as a proactive way of, of improving our lifestyle. So it has to be scaled, it has to integrate into the technology we currently use. In other words, we need a way to get data directly from the device um, to the cloud without having a lot of exotic technology or infrastructure. And finally, it, it goes without saying that these devices generate a lot of data. We need to be able to sort through this data, make sense of it, and give reasonable feedback uh, back to the people who are, are wearing it. So just to summarize the problem statement, there are many different types of people with diabetes. The current technology that's out there only treats the, the top you know, couple percent of them. And so our hypothesis is that if we are able to create more comfortable CGM, continuous glucose monitors, this could significantly impact the, the diabetes um, management problem that we're, we're currently facing. So just, you know, as, as we heard in the introduction, we, we'd like to think that this is not simply another gadget. This is really part of, a, of an ecosystem that could form a new type of proactive healthcare, and we're gonna work really hard on it. So let's get to the, the fun part, which is the, the technology. This is the, the way that we think about our design process. You know, a lot of this conference is about design methodologies, and this is at, at the highest level how we think about our design methodology when we create devices like this. We come at this from, from two different ways. We have a lot of experience in the electronic system design and also a lot of experience in the minimalist RFID, NFC, near field communication type of system. They're very different and both extremely elegant and, and powerful. And all, all of you have experience likely to one or, or both of these as well. On the far left, this is your typical you know, wireless sensor node type of device. And the design methodology here, at least what we have done in the past is, okay, you have some specifications. You wanna deploy a ton of these sensors. You need to make them small and, and cheap. So you're going to scour the earth for the best uh, SOCs and ASICs that are, that are out there. You will, if those don't meet your specifications, you may have to design your own SOC or ASIC for the application. These devices would be validated, packaged, put on a printed circuit board with some surface mount components, a battery antenna, et cetera. This is, this is beautiful. It leverages, um, it leverages the semiconductor industry to its fullest, including the work that you do, including um, IC uh, semiconductor fabrication. And these devices are programmable. They can do data log, they can do whatever you want. The problem is, even if you have a, a relatively minimalist design, they're still, they're still too large, they're still too expensive. It, it, is, it just doesn't make sense to think about taking something on a PCB and, and putting it into a contact lens. It's just, it, it doesn't make, it's a total non-starter. So then you'd naturally kind of start at the other end of the spectrum, which is some very elegant technology that's out there in the RFID space. These devices are extremely small. They're definitely disposable. They're in your passports. They're in, in tags on, on clothing and things like that. The problem is the functionality is extremely limited. In fact, they have no functionality until you approach them, power them up with a reader, and then you get an ID number or, or maybe some sort of authentication back. So what we're interested in is, is kind of the, hopefully the, the best of both worlds. A device that does do data logging, is thin, is cheap, and is also um, disposable. And now you can kind of see a little bit of our ulterior motive here, we wanna make a, a big impact in diabetes, but also we're thinking, hmm, you know, if we, can, if we can take a lot of this type of sensing capability, make it really small, make it small enough to fit into a, a contact lens, and there are probably, probably a lot of other applications of, of this technology as, as well. So this has been a lot of fun, it's been a great learning process, and the contact lens has been a great technology driver. It's forced us to really push the limits on miniaturization power and a lot of the, the circuit design that go into the, into the system. Well, there are other biological, physiological challenges that come up as well. 
The eye is a very challenging environment to, to work in. It's, it has a, we're trying to sense glucose and tear film, but your typical eye has about six microliters of, of tear film on it, an extremely thin layer, just a few microns thick. And so we need to make sure that in addition to just getting the system working, it needs to be able to accurately log glucose in this environment. And it's not simply porting the technology in a standard glucose meter for blood into a contact lens because the concentration of glucose in tears is o over an order of magnitude lower than that in blood. So it's definitely a, a, a daunting challenge. On, on top of that, of, of course, as, as all of you know, the eye is extremely sensitive. It's, it's sensitive to dust. It's sensitive, if, if any of you wear contact lenses, to imperfections in the contact lens, eyelashes. The device has to be extremely soft, supple, and, and comfortable to wear if it's going to be tolerable. And again, the goal here, this is, not, this is not something that can be a burden. This has to be something that you would naturally wear. You don't even, you don't even know it's there. So here are some of the key technical challenges that we've been working on. Um, first is, is miniaturization, thin film integration, taking the typical suite of devices you need for a wireless platform and, and understanding how we can make them essentially two-dimensional and, and flexible, but still leverage all of the advantages of, of Moore's Law and all of the work that you guys are doing. And we'll talk about our philosophy for how we did that. Secondly, the, the platform. We had some very hard decisions to make at the start of the project. You know, do we, do we do our own custom proprietary standard or do we just bite the bullet and say, no, this has to be standards-based wireless and we inherit all of the complications and legacy and benefits that come along with that. And we, we've chosen the, the latter, and, and I'm, at this point, I'm very glad that we did. And finally, getting data from, from this device into your handset as, as fast as possible is extremely important. So here's the, the platform. This is one of the, the parts of the system that I'm um, extremely proud of. We have a lot of great low-power chip designers on the team, and this, this integrated circuit shown on my fingernail is, is kind of the heart of the system. It's a couple hundred micron on a side. It's standard CMOS, we've thinned the chip back to tens of microns thick. You know, the contact lenses that are in your eye right now are about maybe 100 micron thick, that's, that's all. And if you, if you order chips from a fab, you get chips shipped back to you. The, the ICs themselves, without any packaging, without any printed circuit board, are typically you know, 250 micron thick, which is much thicker than the contact lens in the first place. And so you have to do some post-processing just to make sure the IC, without anything else, can fit into the contact lens. So a few of the key blocks that, that go into this, and the wireless charging of, of uh, energy storage devices on the chip, power management, all of this has to be integrated, uh, bi-directional en encrypted wireless link to get data safely to and from the contact lens. You have to have, of course, all the things that you would typically have for a data logging system, on-chip memory, and, and Flexible sensor interfaces as well, because we want this platform to have a, a legacy where we can add more functionality to it over time. So here's a typical um, gratuitous die photo that we would in, include in a, in a talk at, at ISSCC where we'd have all the different parts of the, the chip broken out. I'll highlight a few of them. One is the, the philosophy for the radio here. We've gone with an, an RFID type of system. Uh, two important reasons for that. One is it's essentially zero power. It doesn't consume uh, significant amounts of power while it's, it's sitting there. You can communicate with it whenever you want. There's a carrier sense circuit that will detect when you're trying to talk to it. It'll fire up the baseband and you'll be able to communicate with it. RFID and NFC radios, they don't generate and transmit any RF energy. They rely on backscatter. So the integrated circuit in the contact lens does not have to generate an RF, a precision RF frequency. That's important for two different, very different reasons. One is it saves power. We don't need to generate our 13 megahertz or 900 megahertz carrier and, and actively transmit power off the eyeball. The other important thing to notice is that if we're not generating and transmitting a carrier, then we don't have to have a precision frequency reference on the contact lens. And that's, that's extremely important that we inherit the frequency reference from the device that's reading from the contact lens. We simply don't have room for a lot of surface mount components, like a, like a quartz crystal, for example. Again, we have contact lenses, you know, maybe 100 micron thick. We just don't have much room to work with. But 
the, we have to have precision analog circuitry on board as well. The sensor interface is a high resolution potentiostat. This is a device which reads out from a, a glucose sensor that's on the contact lens. Um, we have different types of additional environmental sensors on board for, for different reasons as well. All the power man ha man management has to be integrated. Those of you who've done work with power management before know that you know, designing an L some of this stuff sounds kind of mundane, like a, a low dropout regulator, but it's really hard, especially when you can't throw large um, decoupling caps and bypass capacitors on the board. All of that stuff has to be integrated onto the chip. And we don't have extremely, extremely dense capacitors on, on chip. We have a few other nice features like LED drivers to allow us to, to do rudimentary user interfaces from the device. And of course, data logging is extremely important. Rough specifications there, we need to be able to log data all day. At the end of the day, you would throw the contact lens away and then use another one the next day. So functionality, all day data logging, and of course, size and cost are extremely, extremely important. Well, that's, that's the integrated circuit, and we're, we're all familiar with how to, how to do that, but it's also a lot of fun looking at the, the interface. How does that circuit actually get information from the human body in, in the first place? And the, the approach that we've taken here is that we actually want to do a true electrochemical measurement on the surface of the eye. It's, it's, not, it's important to note that this is not an indirect, say, optical readout of the glucose signal from the eye. This is a direct electrochemical measurement that's performed on the surface of the eye. We have um, the, the glucose signal is transduced, we digitize it, and we log it on the contact lens. And then at that point, it can be encrypted and transmitted at, at your leisure. So this is the cross-section, kind of the top-down view of what the electrochemical sensor looks like. The constraint that we gave here for the sensor design is, well, okay, it has to work with the very low glucose concentrations and tiers, and it can be no larger than the integrated circuit. And this is kind of the challenge that we put to the, all of the people involved in the system is that we're going to make sure that the largest component that we're putting onto the contact lens is the, is the SOC. Um, ideally, over time, the SOC will, will shrink as we're able to reduce feature sizes of the integrated circuit. But you know, it would be, it'd be a shame if there's a component larger than the, than the SOC. You know, this chip has tens of thousands of transistors on it. Hopefully, it'll shrink over time. Let's make sure that everything else on the contact lens is no larger than that. And this, the sensor is no exception. It's about a little less than a millimeter on a side, similar to the, the IC that's on board. Well, here's how, here's how this sensor works. It's kind of interesting. It's, two parallel plates, platinum electrodes, coated with a glucose oxidase enzyme. And so the transduction mechanism um, works as, as follows. The enzyme converts the glucose into hydrogen peroxide. And so you have hydrogen peroxide that's flowing around these platinum electrodes. The integrated circuit enforces a, a precise potential across these platinum electrodes, and that interacts with the hydrogen peroxide. So we get a flow of electrons and on the order of nanoamps that is proportional to the concentration of hydrogen peroxide. And that H2O2 is in turn proportional to the glucose concentration that the sensor experiences. And this is an industry standard way of, of doing it for different types of continuous glucose monitors that we've adapted to, to the contact lens. There are a few other features that we could talk about. We have a two electrode design instead of a, a typical three electrode design. That's significant, just some of these considerations that you would not normally think about because we don't have a lot of interconnect. We don't want to have a lot of routing on the contact lens. This isn't like a, a seven layer PCB. We, we just we want to make things as simple and as streamlined as, as possible. One final note here is that the, the sensor is, is scalable. There are different types of enzymes. The glucose oxidase is, is obviously very selective uh, to, to glucose, but there are different types of enzymes that you could apply that would be sensitive to other types of biomarkers as well. Now the, the assembly, this is how we, we typically think about the assembly. We, we don't have a fiberglass PCB, um, but we have this electronics assembly. It's a flexible, biocompatible, transparent substrate. And we, we use this, the designers, we see this as our PCB. All the different components we need for the system are integrated onto this platform. The actual chip itself, some energy storage devices, the thin film sensor that you can see in the lower right, and an, an LED, which I'll talk more about later. 
But in addition to sensing, we're also looking at ways of providing feedback back to the user who is wearing this device. First around the outside is the antenna that's used for getting data and power to the device and getting data back from the device. And there are fortunately a few different ways of, of manufacturing these, these devices. Again, cost, in addition to size, cost is extremely important. Da daily disposable contact lenses are you know, less than a dollar each, so we need to be compatible with an extremely low, uh, low cost process. So we've worked on a couple different ways of doing this. Thin film fabrication on top of silicon wafers, where the silicon is used as a handle wafer, that's, that's one way of do it, doing it. We've also worked on roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing processes as well, similar to how standard RFID tags are, are manufactured. But there are fortunately a lot of different options for making devices that are extremely thin, dirt cheap, and, and uh, biocompatible. So this is how everything comes together. We have the integrated circuit itself. It needs to be as small, as thin as possible. That's integrated onto this, this thin ring. It's tens of microns thick. It's extremely flexible, like a, like a piece of foil. And that is then embedded in, in the contact lens. One important thing to notice here is that the overall volume of the stuff in the contact lens that is not regular contact lens material is about 3%. The other 97% of the volume is standard contact lens material that does vision correction and, and everything else. And that's, that's pretty exciting. It means that you know, even, even in something as small as the contact lens, there's actually a lot of real estate available. And if we're only using 3% of the volume of the contact lens for for all of this functionality, then again, this has a lot of potential for other types of devices that you, that you would typically wear. And, and this addition of a very small volume is probably going to be imperceptible. So here's how everything comes together. We've been working very hard with our partners, Novartis, their eye care division, Alcon, is extremely good at making complex contact lenses. So it's a, basically, you could think about this as a three-step process. You start out with the bottom layer, you mold, a, a contact lens in the way that you, the, you typically would. Then you add the electronics package onto it, and then you overmold with a second layer. And that second layer is responsible for encapsulating the electronics, but also providing the precise curvature and the optical surface needed for comfort and for, for uh, vision correction. This is an image of one of our scientists pulling a prototype device out of the mold. It's, it's kind of hard to, hopefully you can intuitively get a feel for what this device looks and feels like. It, it looks and feels like a standard soft, um, soft contact lens. This is what one of our latest devices looks like. It, it looks a little bit different than the, than the earlier devices. One thing that we've been thinking a lot about is, is kind of you know, camouflaging the device. Um, adding different types of color to the antenna lens that would match the iris color. So of course, you know, typically you would, even though I think it, it looks pretty cool to wear one of these devices, not, not everybody would, would think that way. And the, you know, the, the diabetes technology community and people who have diabetes are actually quite, quite sensitive to this. You don't want to, and this is one of the problems with, with pricking your finger, for example. You simply don't want to sit down for dinner and then pull out your lancet, pull out your alcohol wipe, prick your finger, take out your meter. This, this routine is something that people want it to be very, you know, very private. And that's something that we need to respect with the technology that we create as, as well. So have the device, we have the electronics, things look like they're working well. Then the next step is to actually test this on, on the bench. This is one of the tools that we use to characterize this, this technology. Um, a lot of the stuff we had to do from scratch is because there was no predicate for these types of measurements. So this, on the top right, is essentially an artificial eyeball. There's a little silicone pocket with curvature that matches the human eye. Put the contact lens on top of it, and we have a flow cell. That's the pump on the left. It's fully programmable, and it can flow different glucose concentrations inside of artificial tiers across the contact lens. This, there's some data, representative data on the bottom showing glucose concentration. Um, this is data logged on the contact lens and transmitted later as a function of time for about 10 days or, or so as we sweep the glucose concentration over the physiologically relevant range of human t uh, glucose levels in, in tears. So if all of that looks good, it's time to start looking 
ads on body performance. And this has also been a lot of fun, but a huge challenge. The, the challenges of designing the technology itself are, are one thing, but then it adds a whole additional layer of complexity when you look at the clinical challenges. I mean, the human, the human body is, is just so incredibly messy and so variable. And all, you know, all the process variation that we stress about with our, our chips and fight with for our chips is, is just nothing compared to the ridiculous variation of, of the human body. Here's one example. These are two trajectories of blood glucose from two different people. One is a, a normal, healthy subject, and one is a person with diabetes. This is blood glucose measured in milligram per deciliter as a function of time for, for two hours after the person is given a, a glucose drink. The, the normal subject, blood glucose would go up a little bit, the body would produce some insulin, blood glucose would stabilize quickly. Person with diabetes, blood glucose would just keep, just keep rising, or just keep going up. And at some point, they'd probably have to administer some insulin to try to get that blood glucose back under control. So, you know, huge variation just from person to person. But even the same person, day to day, depends on how much sleep they had, what they've been eating, are they stressed? Um, all of these different sorts of things affect, is it, is it hot out, have they been exercising? There's so much variation that we have to deal with. It affects a lot of things, even some kind of surprising. So sensor performance, obviously we need to make sure that the calibration procedures can, can handle this wide variation. But you know, RF, electromagnetic performance, different people have different anatomies, different eye shapes, different facial, facial shapes. When a person moves their eye around, you have a surprisingly large degree of freedom with your, with your eye, and we need this antenna to allow communication regardless of human anatomy regardless of eye position, et cetera. System reliability and comfort. This device has to be comfor comfortable. And again, everyone's perception is different. Everybody's eyes are different. So it's been a pretty amazing learning process. This is one type of experiment that we do on eye with this, with this contact lens. This is a optical coherence tomography device. It's standard. You'd see it in an in optometrist's office. There's an image on the left, and those little cross-section, the green horizontal cross-section lines are shown on the kind of depth profiles on the right, where we can see the surface of the eye, the cornea, we can see the layers of the contact lens, and we can see the thin bar in the middle, which is the antenna trace around the outside. And this is something we do to assess fit of the contact lens to verify the, the internal structure of the contact lens on eye. So the, the final step in this process is what to do with the, what to do with the data. It's, it's one thing to be able to create this device, make sure this device is accurate and comfortable and, and functional. Um, but we need to, of course, be able to get the data from the device to a form that is, that is usable to the person. And, and th at this point in, in 2015, that's, a, that's a, a phone. We need to get the data to a phone. Once it's there, you have a beautiful display to visualize the data. You have direct access to the cloud to do the HIPAA compliance storage, all the analytics that are needed. And you have a good platform to provide actionable, feed, actionable feedback back to the person who, who needs it. And this is a, a, a platform and concepts that are well underway in the diabetes technology community, fortunately. But what we're trying to do is create new types of devices that can plug in to this, to this platform, contribute as much as we can because these technologies are, are extremely critical and urgent. So that's, that's one way of getting data back to the user, but we also wanted to have additional, basically alerts that we can provide to the person. And one way that we're considering doing this is a, is a micro scale user interface built into the, into the contact lens. So we've been working hard on integrating tiny LEDs into the contact lens platform. So Sai, again, like this is a recurring theme, size and power are extremely important. But fortunately, if you have a, a small light source in a contact lens, you don't, you don't need a lot of light. You're trying to, to illuminate a, a portion of the, of the retina. So you're, you're right there, you're close. You don't need a lot of light. But there are a few challenges. One is, of course, size of the device and also focus. Focusing on something on the surface of your cornea is extremely difficult. So that's, that's one of the challenges that we have. Um, but 
there are a few different ways that we can use this technology if we're able to integrate light sources onto the contact lens. Even just a handful of LED, it doesn't need to be presenting a coherent image immediately. It, it can be thresholding. Different color LEDs that could give you high and low if you've exceeded or gone below certain predefined thresholds of glucose. And if we can do that, then a person can be alerted through a, a series of blinks that they're, oh, I better check my glucose. And then they can take out their phone and look at the time series data or, or whatever. Um, but you know, th there are other ways to encode data in a few very simple, uh, a simple display consisting of a few LEDs. The other is different types of patterns that we can impart on the LED signal to look at trending information. And that could give you hopefully even rate of change, which is just as important as the, the raw thresholds themselves. So I'm pretty excited to see where this goes, but at this point, it's, it's also looking promising. Now, one, one final thing I wanted to mention is up to now, we've been talking a lot about diabetes, and that's, I hope I've convinced you that's a big problem and it's worth fighting for. But another important application of, of glucose monitoring, if people, athletics, runners, et cetera, this, this information is extremely valuable for them to learn more about their bodies. And there have been a lot of studies on, on weight loss, how blood glucose information can actually help you lose weight. This study in particular was a two-part study. It was kind of interesting. The first part, the, the question is this. Okay, let's take two groups of people. One is a control group, try to lose weight the old-fashioned way. One is a group who will prick their finger a couple times a day and then use that information and see if it can help them lose weight. And they can do things like you would look at your blood glucose reading and you'd say, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to eat until my blood glucose goes below 90 milligram per deciliter. If, if it doesn't, I'm actually probably not, I'm probably not even, I'm probably not hungry. I probably don't really need to eat. And so that's, that's one way that this, this has been used. The problem is in the first part of the study, the authors had a huge dropout rate. People were dropping out of the study because no one, no one likes to prick their finger. No one likes the needles, the blood. It's, it's very unpleasant. And so then, like, well, we don't want to just let this go because the difference between those two groups was statistically significant. It helped people lose weight to have that information. So, so then they're like, well, let's see what we can do. I know we can get them on board for two weeks. We'll have them prick their finger for two weeks. And then after that, hopefully people would just kind of know you would get a feel for what your blood glucose is. And that's almost the next best thing to actually having the information. So go through a two week training period. And this data on the right shows that unfortunately, that, that didn't work out for us. People are not good at being able to just somehow know your blood glucose. You can't predict it because you, you, may, you may feel hungry, you, you don't feel well, you don't, it's, it's hard to predict. It's something that you need to have an objective measure. And so this, this tells us two things. One is that you know, there are a lot of other applications of, of glucose beyond beyond just simply treating people with, with diabetes. But the other is this technology has to be really easy to use and really comfortable or else people are, are simply not, not going to do it. So just to, to wrap things up, you know, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about what we're thinking going forward. Of course, we're pushing really hard on the glucose sensing technology. It has a lot of potential and, and I hope that, that this can change the lives of a lot of people. Um, but, but also, we've built up this platform that has energy storage, wireless transmission, uh, well, tens of thousands of transistors at our disposal. And as, as all of you guys know, there's a lot you can do with, with a, a bunch of logic and, and sensing capability. So one of the things that we're working on with our partners, Nefartis, is in, it's like, well, okay, we have, we have all these devices on the eyeball. Why don't we try to help correct people's vision? And so we're working on an accommodating contact lens that will allow you to adjust the, adjust the focus to keep far distance objects in focus, but also near, near distance objects in focus as well. Presbyopia is, is the name for the condition. If you need bifocals, you have presbyopia. And you know, everybody over the age of, of 40 or 50 eventually develops presbyopia. It's just a natural, natural part of aging. And so we're hoping to develop technologies with all of this sensing and actuation capability on the contact lens, where we'll be able to adjust the, the focal distance dynamically. And then beyond that, you know, th think about all, all we've been talking about the whole morning is, is glucose, and it's, it's important, but what about all the other hundreds of biomarkers that are available in, in the body to be, to be measured? You know, some of them 
it's not worth measuring every couple of minutes because they don't change that quickly, but there are probably some that are. And there's, there's possibly not a great reason that we're not measuring more of these biomarkers. It, it could be technological limitations, and that could be the reason that we're not taking advantage of this data. And so it, it's very interesting, even for this community, to think about, hmm, what are some of the other things that we should be measuring on the body? And can those different types of data streams uh, be put to use to, to make people feel better? All right, well, thanks. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Happy to answer any questions you have. So I think we have a couple of minutes for, for questions. There's microphones on either side, so please feel free to, to come and ask questions. Hi. Hey, um, Nagu from IBM. Um, so it's actually very interesting, and uh, so this is about the first time we're getting the technology of, let's say, continuous wireless transmission right very close to our body, right? So we had all the previous issues with cell phones and you know safety and all of those aspects, right? So this is as close as a you know, wearable computing, continuous wearable computing into our body. So wh what are the issues and challenges in the clinical trials? What are we doing to you know, address the people that, hey, it's safe enough, then you pricking your hand every time, and just the long-term implications of all of these things? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. So the, the question is one of, of, of safety, electromagnetic um, RF communication close to, close to the body. So the, the, a few things to, to recognize about this technology is it is a, it's a passive RF communication. So the device itself is not transmitting any RF power at all. It is simply observing some of the incident RF power and changing its the antenna impedance to have a dynamic backscatter of the signal. You know, power levels that we're using to interrogate the contact lens are obviously much lower than, than your cell phone transmits. And so we do standard SAR testing, et cetera, to verify, um, you know, verify safety of the device. Okay, I have a question about your choice of using a soft contact lens uh, for this rather than a rigid contact lens. And I guess there's some comfort issues, but I'm wondering if you could move to something like that. Would it help alleviate cost issues or um, allow you to integrate more technology onto the lens? Yeah, so the, the question is why, um, why do we use a soft contact lens instead of a hard, hard contact lens? A couple, a couple of reasons. Actually, a lot of people swear by hard contact lenses. They're optically extremely, extremely good. In fact, um, there's some initial discomfort, but over time people find hard contact lenses to be quite comfortable. Uh, but the, the bottom line is, at this point, soft contact lenses are, are much more popular. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the reason we wanted to do this. We, we wanted to make sure that we could target not just veteran contact lens wearers, but people who have never worn contact lenses before. And the, the bottom line is that it's much easier to, to, to start wearing a soft contact lens than it is a hard contact lens. But you're, you're right. If instead of having this really soft, you know, mushy substrate to work with, if we actually had a rigid, um, rigid polymer, then that could make all, all of the assembly process and robustness much easier to, to design for. That's, that's a good point. Do you have a question over here? Hi. <laughs> um, can you discuss the uh, battery technology a little bit? Yeah, um, a little bit. We can't talk too much about the different, different suppliers we're using, but the same constraints were placed on the battery that were placed on the other parts of the system, which is, Okay, well, we want to have energy storage, um, but the rule is anything we put into this contact lens has to be as small as the, as the SOC. That has to be the, the limiting factor, and that was the case with all the energy storage devices we used as well. The other constraint, and this was a constraint for, um, you know, for the chip designers especially, is, okay, well, that's the, this is <laughs> the number of the number of electrons you have to work with, and you need to make sure that you can log data throughout the entire day. And that was a very, very tough challenge given the severe size constraints of the, of the energy storage devices that we have. Hey, Brian. Uh, Vijay Raghunathan from Purdue. Uh, I had two questions. One was, uh, did your team observe any thermal issues on the internal surface of the contact lens? Was there a temperature increase because of the electronics running? Mm -hmm. And if so, could you comment on uh, you know, how that would impact things? And B, could you also uh, comment about any potential security concerns uh, in addition to the cryptography? Are there other kinds of attacks, security attacks and stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, on uh, such a device. Yeah, so first question was thermal, thermal effects. Are there any, is there a potential for, um, for heat or thermal damage to the, to the cornea due to the inside electronics being close to the inside of the contact lens? And there, you know, the, the power dissipation of the, of the IC inside of the contact lens is necessarily extremely low based on the energy storage devices that we, that we have access to. And in addition, we have you know, on-chip temperature sensors. We've done other types of diagnostics to show there's no, no significant heating um, at all. So that's extremely, extremely low risk. The second question is about security. And that was one of our you know, top constraints from the very beginning. And so our approach there was to do, you know, again, standards-based wireless, where we can inherit all of the security and encryption that comes along with that, with that standard. The other thing that benefits in addition to all of that is that this is obviously necessary, very close range communication as well. So just the physical limitations of the wireless link provide an additional, additional measure of security. Thank you. Uh, this is Netis and Venkates friend from IBM. It's amazing thought and amazing technology. Thank you for bringing this to us. Two questions. One is, uh, I have been wearing glasses for 25 years now. At some point in my life, I tried contact lenses, and I was not comfortable at all in wearing them. So what's the solution Doodle is offering for people who are not either comfortable or being unable to use that? Is there alternative forms in which this particular technology can port, be easily portable? Number two, this is the design automation conference, and you enumerated a bunch of challenges. What, in your mind, are further challenges that our team should be focused on? OK, yeah, so the first question is that, well, you know, I, I mentioned that, well, we would like this technology to be, these contact lenses to be worn by people who don't wear contacts. Well, the bottom line is there are some people who are not ever, ever going to tolerate contact lenses, and we need to, to be aware of that. And that's something we're, we're definitely thinking about. And you know, a lot of the, the technology we've worked on here is, is portable in, in terms of being able to migrate it from a contact lens form factor to other types of form factors on, on the body. But one, one thing to think about is, and I don't want to, to go off on a tangent here, but there have been huge amounts of research and huge research expenditures on non-invasive glucose monitoring. And no one to, to date has been able to, to succeed. And so the, the only constraint is it's likely at the end of the day that you're going to have to be in contact with some sort of, of body fluid. But that's something we're definitely, definitely thinking about. The, the second question is about uh, what should, what should there's so many things I'd love to talk to, to you guys about in terms of the, on the design side, on the automation side. Um, the, the bottom line is these systems, the, these can't be hard-coded ASICs. They need to be flexible. They need, the, the variation of the human body is, is so broad, and, and this, these devices need to learn over time. We need to have programmability. We need to have microcontrollers on these devices. They need to be tiny. We need to have non-volatile memory that is not extremely power intensive to, to read to. So if I had, if there were two things I would love to have today, it would be even lower power, and you guys are doing a great job, even lower power, smaller microcontrollers, and importantly, um, even smaller non-volatile memory that, that is even more power efficient to read and write from. Thank you. Yep. Okay, all right, sorry guys. I hope I'll catch you, catch you later, but I appreciate it. Bye. Well, I hope you um, share my opinion now. This was certainly a wow device, and uh, we are very excited. Uh, it was a great keynote. Thank, Thank you. you so much. It is a tradition that the general chair picks a gift from their home country. Guess what's mine, huh? So I'm German, and um, no, it's not a Stein. It's something <laughs> different. <laughs> it's a handmade device from the German Erzgebirge, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.